Hi, everyone. I'm Mike King. Along with Speedway historian Donald Davidson, we welcome you to another edition of Indy 500, The Classics. But Donald, 1981 was certainly an interesting year. Johnny Rutherford returns after winning his third race in 1980. He has an opportunity to join A.J. Foyt as a four-time winner. A very real possibility, uh, driving for Jim Hall, the same owner for whom he had won in 1980. Uh, but Bobby Unser was strong, and so was A.J. Foyt. And Mike Mosley was driving a normally aspirated Chevy, stock lock Chevy, for Dan Gurney. There was some hot rookies in the field. Kevin Cogan was making his debut this year. Jeff Brabham, Tony Battenhausen, and Jose Lee Garza from Mexico. There'd never been a Mexican driver in the race. He was very young. We thought he was 22. Turns out he was only 19. Let's see how everybody qualifies. celebration in the winter circle, which marks the conclusion of each Indianapolis 500, is among the world's most prestigious and sought-after moments in the career of a professional racing driver. In this case, in addition to crossing the line first, there is the added dimension of visiting winner's circle for the third time. Considering then what you are seeing, it would be entirely reasonable to assume that Bobby Unzer of Albuquerque, New Mexico has just won the 65th annual Indianapolis 500 Mile Speed Classic and has additionally joined a select group of six drivers who have been victorious three or more times since the initial 500 back in 1911. If that is your conclusion, well, you're wrong. This man is the winner. His name is Mario Andretti of Nazareth, Pennsylvania, and he is unique among 500 champions. He did not qualify the car he drove. He started from the very last row. He did not pass under the checkered flag first, and he did not visit Victory Circle. Now, if all this is confusing to you, then come along and take a look at the events surrounding the running of the 65th annual Indianapolis 500. To begin with, there was a record 105 entries ready to compete for the traditional 33 starting positions. There were seven former winners in the starting field, and 10 out of 22 rookies also earned the right to compete for a $1,600,000 purse. Aside from that, everything else was traditional. That is, if rain can be considered traditional. A blown engine can spell the end to an ambitious speed run. Frustration, for a variety of reasons, is ever-present. They work and wait and pray for a miracle. is in staying alive. The checkered flag is the symbol of excellence. In the Speedway Hall of Fame, there is a great silver trophy with a flagman on the top. On it are the likenesses of every winner since 1911. This is a story about some of these men and others who aspired to win during this month of May, 1981. Ray Haroon was first on the Borg Warner Trophy. 48 different men followed. We are concerned with eight of them. Anthony Joseph Foyt holds the all-time record, four wins. Al Unzer, three wins. Johnny Rutherford, three wins. Bobby Unzer, two wins. Mario Andretti, one win. Gordon Johncock, one win. And Rick Mears, one win. The sounds of the powerful engine signal the approach of springtime and the 500. The charge to the first turn begins on May the 3rd. then qualifying, as usual, with rain.
John Mailer slid 240 feet in turn one. Jim Buick spun wildly around him to avert a collision. A.J. Foyt, the first qualifier, 196.078 average for the 10-mile run. Johnny Rutherford, almost as fast, 195.386. Al Unzer, 192.719. Mario is due in Belgium for the Grand Prix, and Rain has brought qualifying to a halt. Someone must qualify for him. In midweek, there are five days for sorting out the cars. Tim Richmond, safe and wiser. Steve Kinzer's car had moderate damage. That was not necessarily his description. Phil Kaliva had to be pried out of his car. The second weekend of qualifying. Rookie Jose Legarza of Mexico City leads the parade at 195.101. That lovely lady is not his girlfriend, that's his mother. Teammate Jeff Brabham, 187.990. Over the 200 mile an hour mark, Bobby Unser has captured the pole position with an average of 200.546. No matter how fast retired driver Wally Dallenbach goes, Mario Andretti will still have to start the race in the last row. That's the rule. Australian Vern Chupin makes the field at 186.548. Then Gordon Johncock at 195.429. Over the 200 mile an hour mark again, but Tom Sneva is not eligible for the pole. Rick Mears, after blowing an engine earlier, makes the field with 194.018. Fractured shoulder and ribs. Perhaps he'll make the 500 next year. Spike Gelhausen just bruises, but he must also wait a year. The field is full. 20 years ago, Australian Jack Brabham came to the Speedway with a new rear engine car. It was underpowered, but still within five years, the Indianapolis front engine roadster went the way of the dodo bird as the new concept took over. In the week between second qualifying and the race, Jeff Brabham and his friend Vern Chupin visit the garage on the Speedway grounds where veteran mechanics Bill Sporley and Barney Wimmer restore yesterday's speed dreams. Jeff heard that his dad's old car was here for some minor work. Well, here it is, Vern. This is the actual car my dad drove here. Oh, what year was that? I think it was 1961. I think we must have been about eight years old then. Gee, they've changed a bit since then, haven't they? Sure. This is a Comfrey Climax engine. They used to use those in the Formula One cars. I think uh, the engine's a lot smaller than what he was racing against. He used to pass them around the corners, but the big often houses used to just blow past him down the straight. So I think he had a lot of fun. I can probably remember more about this than you. Probably. <laughs> What are you doing? Well, we're by the Civic Corporation a little bit. It's uh, a little bit too rich. Well, it still runs, does it? It runs great. Would you like to drive it? Oh, are you kidding? I'd love to. Bobby Answer on the pole for the 1981 Indianapolis 500. Next to him, Mike Mosley with a normally aspirated stock block Chevy. No turbocharger. 
And during this race, uh, watch at about the halfway mark, there's a horrendous accident with Danny on Gaius, and it's a tribute to the construction of the cars that he is able to escape without any more serious injury than he gets. Also on the outside of that front row, A.J. Foyt looking to become a five-time winner here at the Speedway. Let's take a look as the field comes down to the green flag. Sunday, May 24th, 1981. The day begins with a blessing. The early morning belongs to the unsung heroes who rush back and forth, taking care of a million small details. A.J. Watson drives a 1908 Buick, originally driven by Louis Chevrolet. Now the drivers arrive, Vern Chupin and his wife, Jenny. A.J. Foyt is ready, his 24th time. Johnny Rutherford, Rick Mears, Mario back from Belgium, Lindsay Hopkins and Gary Bettenhausen. Bueno suerte, Jose Lee. Time steps up. The minutes fly away, and soon, the magic moment arrives. Bobby Unzer, Johnny Rutherford, A.J. Foyt, and Mike Mosley. It's still Bobby Unzer, Rutherford, and A.J. Mario Andretti, after starting in the last row, is moving up to the front runners. The first man out, Mike Mosley, parts in turn one. Rutherford, a sheared fuel pump drive. 
Rick Mears is in for 18 seconds in the 27th lap. Al Unser, the first in a series of frustrating pit stops. Gary Bentonhausen keeps company with Al Unser. In the 46th lap, Tom Sneva leads, Gordon Smiley is second, Rick Mears is third, Bobby Unser fourth, Jeff Brabham fifth, and Vern Chupin is sixth. After leading on the 57th lap, Rick Mears comes in for a routine service stop. Suddenly, there's a bad fuel spill. Then there's fire. It's hard to see because the fuel is alcohol, but it's burning just the same. Mears evacuates the car. He's got burns on his nose under the helmet. Several crewmen require emergency care, and a year's work and planning are nullified. Danny Angaius works his way through traffic to capture the lead on lap 61. Gordon Smiley wants service right now. Pancho Carter lost compression, lost boost, lost the race. John Cock leads Andretti in the 64th lap. that anyone could survive a flaming crash like this one. Danny Angaius came out of the car with scubs, burns, and some broken bones. But fast action by emergency crews probably saved his life. A beautiful speed creation is now just a piece of junk. Green again, John Cock leads. Tom Sneva parks in turn one, and Bobby Unzer sails by John Cock in the 92nd lap. That rookie from Mexico City moves to the front. Jose Garza leads for a total of 13 laps. In the 132nd lap, Garza comes in. Here is a complete pit stop, fuel, and two tires in 26 seconds. for this year. Gordon Johncock distinguishes himself by passing everyone in sight to take the lead on the 133rd lap. Then it's Jose Garza. He rides it out, keeping his car against the wall until he can get it stopped without endangering other competitors. He's shaken, but he's okay. Almost on top of Garza's accident, Gordon Smiley ends the race in turn four. Now it's the 150th lap for Bobby Unser. He must make one other pit stop between now and the end of the race. So must Andretti. The race is under the caution light. Unser passes other cars while falling back into line. But so does Andretti. This was the start of the controversy that cost Unser the race. In the 152nd lap, Vern Chupin takes 10 seconds of timeout for fuel. He's running fourth. There's a wheel loose on the track. Kevin Kogan, his car running on three, comes in to see if someone in his pit has a spare so that he can finish the race. The seconds tick away as the crew inspects the right front hub for damage. makes his last stop in the 162nd lap as Bobby Unzer passes Mario Andretti in one of the many lead changes in the race. Tom Bigelow steps out of his car in turn one. John Cock passes Andretti for second. Andretti seems to be slowing down. In the 177th lap, Unzer and Andretti both make their final pit stops. John Cock is out in front. Scott Brayton, 
coast to a stop in that very exclusive and expensive turn one parking lot. Unzer leads Johncock, Mario third, Chupin fourth, and Foyt calls it quits on the 180th lap. Suddenly, Johncock is coasting. He's out of fuel, and Mario moves up into second spot. Well, that's the way it finished. Bobby Unzer got his third Indianapolis checkered flag. Mario, close behind, was scarcely noticed, and Bern Chupin drove such a quiet, smooth race, hardly anyone knew he was there. Well, Bobby went to winner's circle. And Mario, in second, had accomplished the almost impossible, driving from last row to second. Bern Chupin came in for a private celebration with his crew and friends. This is his biggest racing moment since being named Rookie of the Year in 1976. Kevin Cogan is fourth, in spite of losing that wheel. Jeff Brabham took fifth, and Jose Garza was named Rookie of the Year. But even while Bobby Unzer savored his third Indianapolis victory, rumors of a pending protest were heard. The official standings are not posted until 8 a.m. the morning after the race. When that time came, Bobby Unzer had been penalized one lap by officials for passing other cars under the yellow flag. An agonized Mario Andretti was declared the winner. Unzer was dropped to second. When I got the news this morning, uh, just right after 8 o'clock from Jim McGee, I. I just didn't know what to say, and uh, it's going to take a while for me to get all my thoughts together correctly. Um, it's uh, supposed to be a delightful experience, and I'm sure in due time it will be. On the other hand, there this, there's a plus and minus here. Uh, it's a very unusual way to, uh, to win an event. All I can say is that I've also had it taken away from me. Uh, precisely the Italian Grand Prix in 1978 was taken on, away from me because allegedly I jumped the line at the start. Uh, in my own mind, all I can say to feel better that it evens that score, but uh, certainly doesn't make Bobby feel any better. The unfortunate thing about that is that he went through all the hoopla, all the beautiful things that a winner experiences uh, in victory lane, and then it was taken away and then the victory is given to me, and I will never get to experience that myself. The winner of this race will never be established to everyone's satisfaction. But all agree that the 65th Indianapolis 500 was a race to remember. A bittersweet victory, shared by two men, and composed of equal parts of glory and agony. controversy. We got Bobby Unser in victory lane the following day having his photograph taken and being interviewed as the winner. It's Mario Andretti. So what happens? Well, Bobby Unser and the Penske team protest uh, the outcome and it drags on for months. It goes to an arbitration committee and it's not until October that the results come down. It's given back to Bobby Unser. And of course, that's the reason why you never see in the film Bobby Unser declared the official champion because it was until October before they finally decided that it would be Bobby Unser's face that would wind up on the Borg Warner Trophy. We hope you've enjoyed this look back at the 1981 running of the Indianapolis 500. For Donald Davidson, I'm Mike King. We'll see you again next time on another edition of Indy 500, The Classics. <laughs>